What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are here with Planet Hulk Worldbreaker, the return of the Worldbreaker Hulk. And what this does is it kind of gives us a storyline that involves the Incredible Hulk a thousand years in the future. It's really, really cool, right? It's an alternate reality story, but it's really, really cool. Now there are gonna be some big differences and some holes that we need to fill as far as Planet Hulk and how all this transpired. And of course we'll cover that as we go through this. But what it does is it initially picks up with what's called the High Priestess. So of course, with this being a thousand years in the future, the planet of Sakaar does not exist the way that it used to. And for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with this, when the Incredible Hulk originally landed on Sakaar, it was led by a guy called the Red King, who was really just a terrible person. But of course, the Incredible Hulk basically overthrew his entire kingdom and then became a kind of peaceful ruler of Planet Hulk until everything went sideways and his family died and then he came back to Earth during World War Hulk and went to war with the Illuminati. But what this does is it establishes or seems to point to this idea that in the absence of the Hulk, that society followed the best possible path it could have insofar as trying to find a way to govern itself. Now, there was a lot going on behind the scenes and we'll talk about that. But one of the things that's established here is that the current people or the citizens of Sakaar hate what are referred to as the Harg. That's basically another name for Hulks. It's what they call them here. And again, we'll fill this stuff in. But what it does here is it initially picks up with a couple of what look like Hulks who are here on this world. And in turn, they're literally just kind of fleeing for their lives as best they can. That the different people out there that have gamma radiation that are by all standards of measurement Hulks are basically being tracked down. They're being hunted. Now, what you also have here is what's called like kind of a, a floating city that just exists out there. They don't really know a whole lot about it. We'll find out about that as time goes on. But what ends up happening is that these two teenagers, basically, these two young people are tracked down and attacked. And of course, that's kind of the establishment that anybody related to the Hulks are tracked down and either killed, captured, or any one of those. Now, the younger boy is ultimately captured here and the girl ends up taking off. But as she makes her way, she ends up coming across another person who's infected with gamma radiation, only for us to find out that it's actually Amadeus Cho. That it is, it is the Amadeus Cho. Now, here's the crazy thing about this, right? How in the world did Amadeus Cho get from Earth onto Sakaar during Planet Hulk? All of that will make sense, right? We'll make sense out of all this stuff. But one of the things that happens is that she presents herself as basically his granddaughter, right? Like literally like you are my granddad, <laughs> we are related and kind of going forward from there. We don't immediately learn her name. But what they also talk about is the nature of the green scar, right? The eye of anger, the world breaker Hulk. Now, Hulk is still around. Banner is still around in this place, but the reality is he's just kind of hidden. He's away, he's removed from everything, and no one readily knows where he is. But Amadeus Cho is very, very kind of uh, coy, right? He's not very forthcoming with information in terms of how all this happened, everything that took place, the collapse of the world, why Hulks are being hunted, all that kind of stuff. The only thing that's really going on here is that this girl's brother was basically stolen, right? Like the grandson of Amadeus Cho, if you want to call him that. And so what they end up doing is basically going on the hunt for Bruce Banner, right? To find Banner and to find Worldbreaker and to basically go forward from there. Now, the other thing they have here is there's kind of like a little bot that Amadeus Cho had created somewhere along the line that is able to kind of move around and is able to broadcast a video image, but it's more watching and it's not really you know, conversing. They can't talk back and forth. Now, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with Amadeus Cho, he was created by Greg Pak in the Incredible Hulk mythos. And the idea behind Cho is that he is this guy who's like one of the top eight smartest people in the world. His power, if you want to call it that, is he can basically analyze any and all variables in any situation and figure out the best possible way to ensure that situation works in his favor. So he's similar to Domino in the sense that Domino from the X-Men can bend luck in her favor. The difference is that Amadeus Cho uses his intelligence to do that. The kicker about all this is that he's exceedingly old here, right? He's centuries old. And so as a result of that, his mental faculties aren't necessarily what they used to be. More so than that, because of the fact that you have them on the lam, right? They're literally on the run. They're ultimately discovered by a sentinel that's operated by the high priestess, which of course tracks them down, tries to attack them. But given his age, the fact that he's exceedingly old, he's not as strong or as capable as he used to be, and because of the fact that this girl is so young and she's inexperienced, they're sort of at opposite ends here, right? So there's not really anybody there in the middle that can easily overpower this Sentinel. I mean, Amadeus Cho does to a degree, but it's not without just straining himself. And things become even more dire when you suddenly have like 
like five more of these sentinels that show up out of nowhere. And so what they realize is that they have to find Banner. They have to find Bruce Banner in order to find a way to either end this threat or at least in some capacity, find a way to save the world. And so where Amadeus Cho is able to kind of think his way out of the situation, it gives him and this girl a chance to get away. But along the journey, we actually see a couple of cool things. One of the things we see, for example, is that it's not just human beings or at least uh, the citizens of this world that have been exposed to gamma radiation. It's also some of the animals too, right? A good example is like this little cat-like animal that's attacked by these soldiers who were hunting down anything with gamma radiation. And it just like morphs into like this gigantic beast that just massacres all of them and then leaves, <laughs> right? But much like we would expect when it came to like Bruce Banner and the Incredible Hulk, it's got its normal form and then it's hulked out form. So it is kind of cool. But the big caveat to all this and the big question that we're kind of left asking here is, how did all these things find themselves exposed to gamma radiation? So again, we'll kind of continue on this journey or we'll answer that as we continue on with this. But ultimately they end up finding this kind of makeshift home of Bruce Banner. And they realize that it's his house because you have Kyra, you've got Korg, you've got She-Hulk, right? Pictures of these guys here. The kicker about all this is that She-Hulk, it's a picture of her, when she's on Sakaar. So again, there's a lot of really cool questions that we'll get answers to. Don't worry, I'm not gonna leave you guys hanging. We'll get answers to all this stuff. But ultimately, Bruce Banner ends up arriving on the scene. Now, one of the things about this is that Banner is initially able, like he talks to them and he communicates with them and kind of hears what it is that they have to say. But it's one of those things where Amadeus Cho introduces this girl as his granddaughter. And when she says like, Bruce Banner, we need your help. You know, he's like, well, I'd be happy to help you. And she says, we're not talking to, talking to you. I'm talking to the Hulk. And that's when we get this kind of old man Logan type situation, right? For those of you guys who don't know about that, in the old man Logan storyline, Wolverine was tricked into killing the X-Men. And as a result of that, he refused to pop his claws. If you want to know any more about that, make sure you check the playlist down in the description after this video is over. Old Man Logan is a phenomenal story. But the reason why I say it's an Old Man Logan type situation is because Bruce Banner almost kind of refuses to let the Incredible Hulk out. When this girl says, like, we're here to talk to the Hulk, the Hulk initially tries to manifest, but Bruce Banner won't let it. And he literally keeps the Incredible Hulk contained. And that's kind of a cool thing that goes on here because he says, like, I'm sorry, the Hulk is not available. So for whatever reason, he refuses to become the Incredible Hulk. And so it's kind of funny because they follow him him and literally it's just like she asked him like like you haven't even heard what it is that we want to have done and he says a thousand years ago i stood with kyra we stared out over the steps and i said maybe we should just leave right we should just go we should just disappear never fight again and she told me you don't have to fear yourself and so he says we went back to save the world you know how that ended, right? Look at this world that we live on. And he says, she died along with thousands of others, gone in an instant when the crown city fell. And the response to this girl is, that was a long time ago, right? Right now there's an evil princess or an evil priestess rather. She's killing every single Hulk that she finds except the little kids that she's kidnapped my brother. And the response of Banner is, that sounds like a you problem, not a me problem. And it's, it's, it's kind of funny because he doesn't do this from the perspective of just kind of dismissing her. He says that it's always the same, generation after generation. It's one of these things where people don't want to make the world better. They just want to make things worse for the people that they hate. The reality here is you do not see the Incredible Hulk as a way to bring peace to this world. You see the Incredible Hulk as a way to punish the people that you hate. And her response is no, like that's not what I'm looking for. I just need the Incredible Hulk so I can basically save my brother. And it's a really interesting set of events here because in a lot of ways, the Hulk doesn't want to have anything to do with this. And literally where she says, fine, then we'll just go find the She-Hulk. His response is no, right? You do not need to go find She-Hulk. So in effect, what we have going on here is the planet Sakaar, where by whatever manner and whatever means, virtually every version of a Hulk on Earth somehow found their way here. And it's really, really cool. It's really interesting because again, it's not something that we've readily seen before. And so that's when this girl asked the question of Amadeus Cho, where's She-Hulk? Where's Jennifer Walters? Only for us to find out that the floating city that exists out there, 
that She-Hulk is the one that's powering it. She's literally hooked up to a machine and her gamma radiation, her energy is what keeps the city afloat. So to a degree, it's kind of dystopian. Honestly, it doesn't really have that kind of dystopian tone. It doesn't feel like Old Man Logan or anything like that, but it is kind of wild because what we end up finding out is that She-Hulk was very much a warrior on Sakaar, right? They call her the Sakaar child, She-Hulk. Harga, right? Like she helped to make the last great piece, but she always knew how to smash. And so it's a really cool thing here because basically she ended up joining Banner on Sakaar somewhere along the line here. And so as they make their way towards trying to find She-Hulk, they're again set upon by some more Sentinels, but they're actually saved from these Sentinels by the timely arrival of Korg, who is very much alive here in this, this reality, right? And so what ends up happening is Korg basically reveals the reason he's here is because he received the message that they had when they were asking for aid and they were trying to find She-Hulk. And of course, what we also end up finding out is that this girl's name is Tala. Now her brother's name is also Balo, I'm pretty sure. So, I mean, their names aren't overly important, but I'm sure some people may have been wondering by now, but it is one of these little moments where she finally reveals her name to Cho. And in fact, Cho actually asks for it. But what you have with the arrival of Korg is that one, Korg knows who Amadeus Cho is. So it's kind of this feeling that like the gang's all here. More so than that, once Amadeus Cho and this and Tala are brought to the floating city by Korg, they immediately seek out She-Hulk. And once they come across Jennifer Walters, what we end up finding out is that she's been hooked up to this machine for 87 years. She's been here for an incredibly long time. Now, the other revelation here is that as far as She-Hulk's concerned, she's what's called an original Hulk. And that because of the gamma radiation in her system and the nature of her being a Hulk, the healing factor and all that kind of stuff, she's also centuries old. She's lived a thousand years. She's been here for an incredibly, or at least been alive for an incredibly long time. More so than that, there is a level of exhaustion that comes with the fact that her gamma radiation is constantly powering the city. But of course, when Amadeus Cho shows up here, she kind of asks the question, what brings you here? What's going on? And he says, a lot's been happening here. And so what she does is she unplugs herself from the city once all the information is given to her by Amadeus Cho. And the reason why is because the various priests and the kind of religious governing body on this city has quite literally been lying to She-Hulk about everything going on on the surface, that she spends all her time inside this kind of engine room. So the only information she has in terms of what's going on in the world is whatever it is that they tell her. And the world has turned into a very dark place. Now, again, I know there's a lot of mystery here. I know there's a lot of questions that are not being answered yet that you probably have. Bear with me. We are gonna answer them. There is going to be a tell-all towards the end of all this, but again, not every question is gonna be answered. So we're gonna kind of have to throw in our own, our own perspective on what we think actually transpired. And so of course, with them having She-Hulk at their side and She-Hulk being stronger than Amadeus Cho and of course, Tala herself, they end up bringing her to where all the young kids are being held. The problem is that this was an ambush. It was literally a giant ruse because once Amadeus Cho gets in there, he realizes that the, the initial assumption he had that the kids are being experimented on or something like that by the high priestess, that all goes out the window. There's no machinery or anything. They're just being held in a room that has nothing in it. And so that's when the whole ruse is up. Right, the jig is up and we end up finding out it was a trap. The whole thing was to lure Amadeus Cho along with, uh, along with Tala and then to basically find a way to destroy them. Not only that, to try to find a way to capture She-Hulk. And so what we end up getting is this explanation of seemingly what had gone on when it came to Planet Hulk, or at least it came to the story. What we end up finding out here, and this is where we kind of have to inject our own perspective here, that of course the, uh, the original events of Planet Hulk do seem to have taken place here. The Incredible Hulk was tricked by the Illuminati into going onto a ship with the intention of sending him to a peaceful planet. He passed through a wormhole. He ended up on Sakaar, which was war-torn. He overthrew the existing government alongside Kyra and the other members of his warbound, Korg, and so on and so forth. And that seemed to lead to the events of Planet Hulk, which led to, led to basically the death of Kyra and so on. Him coming back to Earth, waging war against the Illuminati, and everything kind of transpired from there. But again, there's nothing to confirm this, but there's also nothing to deny it. What seems to have happened here is that following the events of the original Planet Hulk and World War Hulk event, and possibly even the events of like the Heart of the Monster Hulk storyline, that Bruce Banner returned to Sakaar, except this time he brought Amadeus Cho and he brought She-Hulk. And that once they arrived here on this world, that what had basically taken place is that there was a kind of war that had happened on Sakaar 
following the, the leaving, right? Following uh, the departure of the Incredible Hulk and his Warbound. And that once these different Hulks returned here, that basically She-Hulk brokered peace, right? Between like the third and fourth uh, regimes, right? The empires basically. And for a time, the world was a peaceful place, but by whatever manner and whatever means, war ultimately broke out yet again. This time, when war did break out, that you had a high priestess, right? She was literally watching everything that transpired. That specifically, she was a shadow priest. Now, for those of you guys who aren't familiar with that, Kyera was a shadow priest, right? They are individuals who are associated with the old strong, basically the ability to manipulate the earth. And in fact, the, the shadow priests themselves were allies of the Incredible Hulks and all these folks who were fighting in this war. They were fighting to save the lives of the shadow priests. But as this whole event transpired and as this war unfolded, this particular shadow priest began to realize what the Hulks were capable of, right? She literally says, everything I was ever taught said that there was reason to the world, that what we do matters, that each one of us has a role to play, a particular purpose, but against the power and fury of the Hulks, nothing matters. 10,000 Imperial soldiers died that day. Yes, they are my enemies, but they were flesh and blood, just like me, not monsters like you. And so in reality, as flimsy as this plot is, the entire basis of why this high priestess is going around and hunting down every Hulk she can find and killing them is because she sees them as a, a clear and present danger to their own existence. And so that's it. <laughs> that's why she's doing all of this. And she literally just wants to kill them all. And there's really nothing more to it than that. And so what ends up happening is she basically activates a machine within the core of the world itself that starts to pull the world apart. Now, not everyone knows this. And in fact, because she's a high priestess, she is kind of the religious leader of seemingly everybody on Sakaar. And so what ended up happening is she basically foretold, quote unquote, the end of the world as a result of the Hargs, right? The Hulks. When in reality, this end of the world that she was preaching about would be of her own creation. It's just no one would know the truth about what was going on. It would make her look more important and more powerful than she actually is. Now, the other part of this is we end up learning about how events transpired from the Incredible Hulk's perspective. And what he does is he basically approaches the statue of Kyra and he says, you brought this world together. When I stood by your side, I thought I could too. If you were here now, you'd know how to heal without harm, like you did the first time it all fell apart. While I raged, you focused and saved our children, our beautiful boys, you gave them your old power so you could protect them forever as they protected their worlds. Now, the Incredible Hulk is referring specifically to Scar as well as Hero Kala. Now, Scar is more well known, if for no other reason than the fact that we saw that crappy hippie version at the end of the She Hulk show. But Scar in the comics was amazing. He was a really cool character. Think of like everything you saw with Scar in the She Hulk TV show and imagine like the complete and total opposite of that. And that's what Scar was, right? Literally, you look up the definition of badass in Marvel Comics, you're gonna see a picture of Scar next to it. He's like, like, uh, like if, if Conan became the Incredible Hulk, right? Just the most amazing thing ever. This guy went toe to toe with the Juggernaut at one point in time. It was awesome, right? Scar was so fantastic. Of course, Scar and all that kind of stuff is all covered down in the Incredible Hulk playlist that we have, which you'll also find in the description. In addition to Old Man Logan, pick whichever one is interesting to you. Hero Kala is the son that very few people know about in, uh, in the Marvel Comics community, but he's actually the more powerful between himself and Scar. He actually almost killed Galactus, right? Hero Kala was nuts in terms of how powerful he was. It was crazy. But the reality here is that the histories of these characters do seem to be intact, right? Hero Kala had basically died. Scar, I think, think is dead. I haven't seen hide nor hair of that guy in Marvel Comics for years. Like, I don't even know if he's a thing anymore. But the important thing is that the, the histories of these characters do seem to be intact. But so much time has passed that either they're dead or they're simply just out there doing their thing, that they're no longer part of the equation. Technically speaking, in this comic, at the end of the first issue is a backup story that kind of focuses on, on Scar being on Earth, but it doesn't really establish anything. Right? He just kind of feels abandoned by his father. And like, that's basically it, right? So, Again, we don't really get a whole lot of information there. It's really kind of a pointless story, to be honest with you. But the thing about this is that with Banner feeling the effects of the world quite literally being torn apart, and that She-Hulk
Hulk's being used to power this device that's literally destroying the world. But what ends up going on here is that Amadeus Cho ends up meeting with Bruce Banner, albeit through a kind of computerized device. But what he tells Banner is, don't come here, right? Like, do not come to this location. Everybody wants the Incredible Hulk to do it. But if he does, because of the fact that Hulk is literally just this kind of force of rage that there's not a whole lot that anybody could do to stop him if he just blows his lid and starts destroying everything. Now that's one of the big differences between the original World Breaker Hulk and the one that we see here. The original World Breaker Hulk was far more in control of himself, right? Far more in control of his emotions. That was perfectly established by the time you got to the events of World War Hulk. It wasn't just the Incredible Hulk indiscriminately smashing everything. He could speak clearly and he was incredibly intelligent. Not Professor Hulk level intelligent, but was like more intelligent than Savage Hulk usually is. This version of the Hulk here doesn't really seem to have that level of intelligence, right? It just kind of seems to be a raging beast in some ways but we're actually gonna find out that's not the case, that he's every bit as intelligent as the original World Breaker Hulk, that the legacy of him being this kind of raging, rampaging beast is more a result of how things transpire during the different wars that took place on Sakaar, as opposed to the actual nature of himself. Now, of course, Amadeus Cho is able to basically free Jennifer Walters from the device that's literally causing the world to break apart, but the problem is that even when she's freed from this, that the damage is too far done, right? It's literally just shaking apart. There's really nothing they can do at this point in time. And so that literally leads to the Incredible Hulk showing up on the scene. Now, the kicker to, battle, the kicker to, to this whole thing is that the High Priestess is the one who's ordering all these different people to go through and kill every Hulk they can. But they've got, they've got reservations about this. One, because they're not warriors. They're not soldiers. And two, because they weren't necessarily on board with wiping out all the Hulks. Just because of the fact that, yes, the High Priestess is their leader, but while we don't necessarily, or at least we didn't necessarily see what was going on behind the scenes, the illusion here is that anyone who stood against the High Priestess was summarily executed, right? Like they were made an example of. So if only out of fear, most people didn't stand against her. But the reality is the legacy of the Hulk is sure one of like violence and destruction and rage and all that kind of stuff. But people also remember the fact that he liberated Sakaar from the power of the Red King and that in turn, he did lead a peaceful planet for a period of time. So for in a lot of ways, people's question is, why should we be trying to destroy the Incredible Hulk, right? This is Carson. Why shouldn't we simply just like ally ourselves with this guy, right? The unification of our of, of all of us is much better off than like all of us waging war against each other on a dying world and spending our last moments in like a state of conflict. And so with the Warbound basically reformed, albeit with a different roster than we traditionally saw, you've got Amadeus Cho Hulk, you've got Worldbreaker Hulk, and you've got She-Hulk who were all unified together alongside Korg. The problem with this is that with this machine underground and it continually pulsing and tearing the world apart, the only thing Amadeus Cho can think of as a way to basically destroy the machine is to smash it, right? Like it's the only thing he can think of, which is what Worldbreaker Hulk is best at doing. So he does exactly that, right? He literally smashes the machine and it basically keeps the earth or keeps the world protected, right? It keeps the world from breaking apart. But the other part of this is Amadeus Cho says the priestess machine wasn't just splitting the surface. It was trying to stop the molten core of the planet from spinning. And that by basically destroying the machine, it stopped the core of the planet, right? Like at this point, the planet will inevitably just die, right? I mean, it's, it's, there's seemingly no way to stop it here. And so Worldbreaker Hulk realizing oh, like he's the only one that can basically save the world, jumps into the core of the planet. And when he does so, he basically smashes the planet's core, which sends it back into motion again, right? Gets the planet's core moving again, and then ultimately saves the day. In response to this, the world experiences a reunification, right? The realization that the Incredible Hulk is not nearly as dangerous and terrible as the High Priestess made him out to be. And that under what is in effect the leadership of the Hulk alongside the rest of the Hulk family, Sakaar's kind of led into a peaceful future. In terms of what happens to the High Priestess, we don't necessarily know. There's no indication that like she was executed or anything like that. But yeah, that's basically this story. I mean, it was ass. This story was terrible. It was really, really bad, but it is the return of the World Breaker Hulk. So with that being said, guys, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna bring this travesty of a story to the end, uh, to an end. Thank you all for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.